The Byrne and Hardy classification describes osteochondral defects, or OCDs, of the Taylor dome. An OCD lesion can cause injury to the articular surface, subchondral bone, or the cancellous bone. These lesions are susceptible to osteonecrosis because the compressed or avulsed fragment has a lack of significant soft tissue attachment and therefore poor blood supply. In this video, we're going to review the pertinent anatomy, the etiology of these lesions, the biomechanics and mechanism of injury, the shape and location, the clinical presentation and physical exam findings, different imaging modalities, the classification itself, and finally the treatment, and I will focus primarily on surgical. In terms of anatomy, there is one really important concept to keep in mind, and that is the thickness of the articular cartilage. If you imagine this being the Taylor dome, this being anterior, posterior, and this being medial, and this part being lateral, the entire dome is covered with articular cartilage, or hyaline cartilage and the thinnest cartilage is found along the most medial and most lateral rim of the dome. Again, the thinnest cartilage along the most medial and the most lateral rim. However, the thickness of the medial rim is slightly more so than on the lateral rim. And overall, the thickest cartilage of the dome is found in the center. So again, just to review because this is the most important concept to keep in mind. The thinnest cartilage is along the most medial and the most lateral rim of the dome. The medial rim, the thickness here is a little more so than what is found along the lateral rim. And overall, the thickest is found right here in the center. And we're going to come back to these points later. Also, in terms of the tibial play fund, the cartilage in the distal aspect of the tibia is much thicker than anything found on the Taylor dome, which is why an OCD almost never occurs in the tibial plafon. The most common cause of either medial or lateral lesions is trauma. Let's start with the lateral lesions. Because the lateral dome has the thinnest cartilage, almost all lateral lesions are associated with acute trauma, well over 90% of the time. For medial lesions, because the cartilage is a little thicker, about 60 to 70 percent of these are associated with acute trauma. The remaining 30 to 40 percent are associated with other causes, such as repetitive overuse type of stress or vascular insufficiency leading to osteonecrosis. So if you're ever taking an exam and the question stem says something about ischemic etiology, think medial lesions. Both medial and lateral lesions occur when the foot is inverted at the time of injury. An inversion causes lateral rotation of the talus. The difference occurs in the sagittal plane, meaning is the ankle joint dorsal flexed or is it plantar flexed? If you recall from anatomy, the Taylor dome is wider anteriorly. So during dorsal flexion, the talus sits tightly within the ankle mortis. And as the talus rotates lateral, its shearing force causes compression of the anterior portion of the dome against the articular surface of the tip of the fibula, producing an anterolateral lesion. During plantar flexion, the narrow proximal half of the talus sits loosely within the ankle mortis and is stabilized by ligaments and tendons. And this configuration is more mobile. And as the talus rotates lateral, a torsional force causes direct axial impaction against the articular surface of the tibia, thereby producing a posterior medial lesion. In regards to the location, keep in mind that these lesions can occur anywhere on the dome. They won't necessarily always be confined to the medial rim or the lateral rim. They have been found in the center of the dome, even though that's where the thickest cartilage is, but they only account for about 5% of all lesions. They are rare, but they can occur. In terms of shape, medial lesions tend to be larger, both in surface area and depth, and they extend about 2-5 to five millimeters. They are more stable, so they have a less tendency to displace. And they're described as being cup-shaped, and they're more common than the lateral lesions. Lateral lesions are, lateral lesions are smaller, both in surface area and depth, and these extend 1-2 to two millimeters. 
they're less stable, so they have an increased tendency to displace. And they're described as being wafer shaped. So if we're taking an exam and you see the term cup shape, think medial lesion. If you see the term wafer shape, think lateral lesion. Oftentimes, patients will present with a history of an inversion type of ankle sprain that has not healed after six to eight weeks of treatment. And most patients will describe a deep, dull ache in the ankle joint that is worse with weight bearing. Now what makes the physical exam difficult is that there is no specific maneuver that you can do to rule in or rule out an OCD. What I mean is, when you think about something like a neuroma for example, you can do a Motors test. When you think about PTTD, you can do a single heel raise test. When you think about Achilles tendon ruptures, you can do the Thompson test. But with an OCD, there's really nothing. So, the key to diagnosis is maintaining a high index of suspicion. So whenever a patient has ankle pain, we should always keep an OCD as a possible differential diagnosis. Also, you should know that because these are injuries to the articular surface, these can lead to post-traumatic arthritis over time. We'll talk about three imaging modalities and the important points to know for each. Acute, non-displaced lesions do not always show up on initial x-rays, so normal films in the acute setting do not necessarily rule out an OCD. MRI, however, is really good for picking up those early non-displaced lesions. It's also good for evaluating the subchondral bone and the articular surface, and it's good for evaluating for any type of bone mural edema. And finally, CT is great for surgical planning because it can evaluate the exact depth and location of the lesion. The classification is based off radiographic findings. There are four stages that were originally described by Burton and Hardy, and later Loomer added a fifth stage. Stage 1 is also known as a transchondral lesion. It is compression of the cartilage or subchondral bone, and it involves no cancellous bone. Stage 2 is a partial, partially detached lesion, and the main portion of that fragment is still attached to the talus. Stage 3 is a completely detached but non-displaced lesion, and stage 4 is a completely detached displaced lesion, and the lesion may also be inverted, meaning that fragment may also be inverted. And finally, stage 5 is a subchondral cyst. And these can occur after stage 1 or 2, and they're thought to be due to resorption of the necrotic bone, and these may be associated with arthritis. Conservative treatment can be used for stage 1, 2, and 3 medial lesions, whereas early surgical intervention is recommended for stage 3 lateral and stage 4 lesions. The first line of surgical intervention, regardless of the stage, is debridement and curatage with microfracture and drilling. And the idea is to recruit mesenchymal, mesenchymal stem cells that would differentiate into the defect. Another surgical treatment option is using internal fixation. And this can be used if you have a flap that is viable and large enough. However, some surgeons are hesitant to go down this route because while doing surgery and putting in the hardware, you may actually inadvertently fracture the fragment, thereby making it non-viable. If the first line of treatment fails, there is a new treatment option that is gaining more popularity, and that is to use autologous chondrocyte implantation.